Okay, guys, you made it to video three. And um, we're, at this point, we're looking at kind of early American history. And for whatever reason, um, your January final doesn't ask any questions about George Washington, which is a little weird, but whatever. Um, instead, it uh, actually the exam kind of jumps right to uh, John Adams, which is actually our second president. Um, and uh, just a little bit of background. While John Adams was president, um, there, basically there was this real big fear that, um, war with France was going to break out at any minute. Um, and so, I mean, this was a legitimate, they thought it was, it was just a matter of time. And so a law was passed to protect the country from this threat. Okay. And this law was called the Alien and Sedition Acts. They were called the Alien and Sedition Acts. And as soon as you hear Alien and Sedition Acts, you should always think of this picture, right, which you saw in class. Um, basically, the Alien and Sedition Acts, again, were a series of laws. It was more than one. It was a bunch of laws. And um, it, it, the alien part of the name refers to the fact that... Um, it, the laws made it harder for aliens, meaning foreigners, to become citizens of the U.S., and it made it much easier to kick them out of the country. But the other part of the uh, law, the Sedition Act part of the law, that um, basically went after free speech. So um, it basically made it illegal for anyone to oppose the government, to go against the government, and to say anything, um, you know, uh, say anything that would be, might be con considered seditious means, you know, against the government, like, the, uh, like a, like being an enemy to the government. Anyway, um, it, what ended up being the result is because of these sedition acts, a bunch of newspaper editors were actually arrested and some of them were actually put into prison. So that's why if you see in the, the little kids in the graphic. You see they're labeled free press, free speech, honest opinion. This would happen. If you said anything about the government, you could wind up in jail because of these laws. Anyway, long story short, these are terrible laws. Um, and actually they were so bad that the Virginia and Kentucky legislatures passed a resolution declaring that these federal laws were invalid within their states. Um, they believed that the acts violated the Constitution. They said as it, it, it was up to the states, if the states felt that a federal law was against the Constitution, if it violated the Constitution, the state had the right to ignore or nullify the, the law um, and just ignore it and not enforce it. Um, so these Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, Thomas Jefferson was one of the authors of them. Anyway, just FYI, you don't need to know this for the final, but um, just so you know, this is kind of a big deal. Um, even though the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions didn't have that big of an impact at the time. Um, but really these, these laws, this, these resolutions were challenging the authority of the central government. And they become more important later because, um, during the civil war period, people would trot out the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions as justification for ignoring federal laws. So, um, anyway, um, so like I said, you just need to know the Alien Sedition Acts um, and uh, what they did, what their effect was, and, you know, be aware of the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions and what they were designed to do. Long story short, these laws were a huge mistake for President Adams. They were they were very un, unpopular. And um, as a result, he ended up losing to Jefferson. He ended up losing the election to Jefferson. And almost all of the Alien and Sedition Acts were repealed or they just expired. They, they ran out. Um, so uh, anyway, so let's move on. So Adams is no longer president. As I said, Thomas Jefferson has won the election. And, you know, we can't talk about Thomas Jefferson without talking about the Louisiana Purchase. And whenever you think of Louisiana Purchase, I'm sure you're thinking of this graphic, right? And so, um, as you remember, there were, you know, for Thomas Jefferson, you know, he's being offered all this land for super cheap. And, you know, but still there were some, there were some pros and cons about whether or not he should take it. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, 
even though buying the land violated his personal principles of strict interpretation, there was no way Jefferson was going to say no to buying this land. Um, and why? Because by buying the Louisiana Purchase, he gained control of the Mississippi River and he gained control over the port of New Orleans. Those are, they were absolutely critical. Um, the access to the Mississippi River, access to New Orleans was critical to shipping for the U.S., um, to our ability to engage in foreign trade, and, and there was no way he was going to say no. All right, so now he's bought this huge chunk of land. He's basically doubled the size of the country, but he has no idea what's on it. So what is a president to do? Of course, he's going to ask his friends, Lewis and Clark, to you know, explore the land and, you know, zip around and figure out what the heck is there. And of course, this expedition is critical to um, enabling us and the president to understand what the land had. So this, you know, this Lewis and Clark expedition, because God, God forbid we name the expedition after, oh, I don't know, Sacagawea maybe? Because Sacagawea was the only person on the trip who actually knew where she was going. No, no, let's just name it after the two white guys, Lewis and Clark. So, yes, you need to know the names Lewis and Clark and, you know, the effect of their little trip through the territory. But, you know, don't feel bad for Sacagawea because she gets her face on the dollar coin, which literally no one uses. Anyway, let's move on. We can move on. So we've got this huge chunk of land known as the Louisiana Purchase, which is great for now. But you should always remember as soon as you purchase, as soon as we add new land to the country, it has the potential to throw off the balance between free and slave states. So what ends up happening is um, within the Louisiana Purchase, you get uh, the area of Missouri, and Missouri will eventually apply for statehood. Um, but they would like to apply for statehood as a slave state, which could, again, potentially throw off that balance. So to avoid conflict, they come up with a compromise. And the compromise is this. Missouri is going to join the Union as a slave state. To keep the balance, Maine will join the Union as a free state. And then the final part of the Missouri Compromise is that they draw a line at 3630. And this line is going to divide the territory so that any area above the line would be free, any area below the line would be slave. And this Missouri Compromise, this compromise allows the country to avoid a conflict over slavery. Or, you know, at least avoid it for a little while. Anyway, all right, so the last thing we need to talk about is the effect of the Erie Canal in New York and the National Road. Um, again, I just spoke to you about this in class, so just a reminder, when you think about this, um, these two things, uh, both the Erie Canal and the National Road, are both built to connect the Midwest slash, you know, kind of Ohio River Valley area, that, that area, that North uh, Midwest area of the country, to the Atlantic coast, which is on the east side of the United States. All right, and with that, you are done with this video.